Uh, thanks very much, Paul, and uh, welcome back. I'd like to express a special welcome to uh, some uh, friends and family who have been actively recruited to boost our national viewer ratings. Uh, thanks to them for, for watching. Um, I had promised today, uh, and actually Laura had announced that I would be taking up in today's discussion the book by James Cohn, the black theologian recently uh, deceased, uh, discuss his rather well-known book, and I think a very, a very important book indeed, called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. But I'm going to have to break my promise because there's so much to say about John Lewis, and I need to complete that. And I wanted to add Wendell Primus to add a few thoughts at the end of today's discussion on his impressions of John Lewis as member of Congress. Uh, I will tell you that in, in looking at the material I've been reading, there's very little really general discussion of John Lewis as legislator. There's much more discussion of him as civil rights activist. So I think we need to fill in that side of John's uh, life. And I think Wendell will help us to do that. For those of you who don't know Wendell, those people who are from outside the church. Uh, Wendell is a top uh, health and budget uh, uh, advisor to Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And I just learned this from Wendell uh, this morning. He is now the top aide in the discussions that the speaker is engaged in with Secretary Mnuchin on the, uh, the special stimulus package that Congress is is uh, discussing. So I'll ask Wendell at the end of these remarks to add a few reflections on Lewis as legislator. Well, a summary of what we said last time and uh, where we're going uh, today. Uh, in these two sessions, I'm attempting to exemplify the basic assumption of liberal Protestantism that was so influential in the 19th and early or let's say first half of the 20th century, especially in the 50s and 60s. Uh, namely that the Christian gospel uh, is especially potent when interpreted in the light of urgent social and political concerns. It's interesting by the way that John Lewis himself dates the rise of the civil rights movement from 1955 and the famous and uh, uh, of course, disreputable lynching of um, Emmett Till in that year, 1955. Uh, he was activated and so many other people were. Emmett Till, you recall, was a young lad from Chicago, happened to be visiting Mississippi, uh, was alleged to have made a wisecrack to a woman and for that was lynched. Uh, that, was a, that was a rousing moment, sort of like the George Floyd thing in our present uh, situation. In any case, that's 50s and 60s that we're talking about. And my point is that the civil rights movement of which people like uh, John Lewis and James Cohn were very, uh, very much uh, active, uh, that is uh, quite a part of the period regarding the rise and influence of liberal Protestantism that I'm talking about. So exhibit A in my proposition is the life and uh, influence of John Lewis, a famous civil rights worker and member of Congress for 34 years. I argued last time that John Lewis represents what I called a chastened form of the social gospel. I said that the social, social gospel is a, an American religious movement that understood Christian symbols and doctrines, particularly the image of the kingdom of God, in John Lewis's terms, the beloved community, that, that thought of those concepts uh, as ideals for social and political reform. I suggested that Lewis's position was chastened because while holding firm to that ideal vision, he also demonstrated in his life and reflections uh, how costly the effort of pursuing the kingdom can actually be. By repeatedly submitting to unthinkable abuse uh, 
at the hands of law enforcement officials and hostile crowds, he and his associates exhibited for all to see the forms of sinister opposition, resistance that lie in wait for all those who seek to do the, the work of the kingdom. And that, that opposition, that resistance, the frustration and difficulty of pursuing the, the, the way of the cross, if you will, was something the social gospelers in their naive optimism and their belief in moral perfectionism, if you just try harder, if you just let God in, things will turn out eventually all right. Uh, that's something they failed to admit, the difficulty, the obstacles in the way of the Christian life, the costliness of the Christian life. Uh, I offered the phrase sacred struggle to characterize Lewis's essential method. Um, in his more colloquial terms, but I think it means the same thing, he spoke of good trouble. In other words, it's trouble that you get into for a good purpose, but it's trouble nevertheless, and it's going to bring the consequences of trouble, and you'd better be fully aware of that. I should reiterate at this point that for Lewis, the values he sought to uh, represent and advance, uh, caring for the, the hungry, the sick, the poor, the prisoner, the alien, and trying to overcome the divisions caused by race, economic status, gender, all of those values that Lewis advanced were not essentially or especially Christian values. They were values available to everyone and people around the world of different faiths and persuasions are well, are well uh, they well recognize those values. But, but Christians, and this is the point from Lewis's point of view, Christians regard those values as sacred, which invests them with a special kind of importance and uh, reliability. In, uh, John Lewis referred to these values as right no matter what, always right, uh, uh, always reliable. Uh, that's, the, that's the sacredness of the, of the values that Lewis is in the business of pursuing. Uh, last time, this idea of a chastened form of social gospel brought us to the thinking of Reinhold Niebuhr, who above all thought of the Christian message as a sacred struggle. For him, like Lewis, the symbol of the cross was central, as were the ideas of sin and redemption, understood, by the way, socially. The individual emphasis was not that great, but the social understanding of those terms was huge. Incidentally, I heard a sermon not too long ago uh, which suggested to the congregation that this whole idea of the cross should be discarded as a kind of downer and as amounting to little more than a piece of jewelry right now. And I happen to know a Protestant minister who has vowed, pledged, never to utter the word sin again because of the uh, bad connotations that he thinks that word has taken on. I do not deny, nor would Niebuhr or Lewis deny, that the words cross and sin have been abused, have been trivialized. That's, there, there's no question about that. But if they were pressed, Niebuhr and Lewis, to find substitutes for those terms, particularly in the social realm, they would be hard pressed to do it. So they were in the business, I'm trying to say, of recovering the social political pertinence of those ideas. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr was very much read and discussed by proponents of black theology. Uh, I'm going to include Martin Luther King here too as I go, because Lewis and King had an extremely close relationship. As you read Lewis's own biography, autobiography, he stresses that connection, how much uh, King influenced him in his thinking. And um, uh, in particular terms, Lewis, against the advice of the leadership of SNCC, continued to be a board member in the Southern Leadership Christian Conference 
of which Martin Luther King, this SCLC, of which Martin Luther King, as we all know, was such a prominent member. So Lewis ha had a practical link uh, constantly to King as well as a theoretical link. And that's very important to, to remember. And that's why I think we can safely take up King as we talk about Lewis's thinking. But I'm trying to say that both Lewis and King had a kind of ambivalent attitude towards Reinhold Niebuhr. Parts of his thinking were very compatible with their understanding, parts of it not so much, although sometimes, as I'll show, the uh, differences are rather more subtle and quite interesting as between Niebuhr's thinking and Lewis and King. Let me start by comparing Niebuhr and Lewis, as well as King, by emphasizing, I think, the most important point of similarity, which is a theological one. It can be summarized like this. The cross is a symbol of power, of the power of weakness. Niebuhr made much of Paul's statement that God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things and the things that are despised to bring to naught the things that are. Jesus's willing acceptance of his unjust, humiliating execution on the cross at the hands of the Roman Empire without trying to retaliate in kind and by replacing anger and hatred with love and forgiveness represented a radically novel way of reacting to the exercise of unjust force and abusive political power. It encouraged a whole new way of understanding and interpreting relating to abusive power and, and abused force. Um, John Lewis, as well as King, wholeheartedly, and I can say this without qualification, wholeheartedly endorsed these theological insights of Reinhold Niebuhr, but they carried them, and this is an important point, they carried them in a somewhat different direction from the way Niebuhr did. Uh, they put into practice some of this idea of weakness as power in ways that Niebuhr refrained for interesting reasons from doing. Uh, these theological insights uh, underlay, as you can readily see, the philosophy and practice of nonviolence for which Lewis and King and many of the members of the civil rights movement were duly famous. For them, nonviolence disarms unjust force and robs force of the excuse or uh, abusive force, unjust force. It robs that kind of force of an excuse to be used. Nonviolence, in short, unmasks the naked viciousness and pitilessness of the policies of state authorities like Sheriff Bull Connor in Montgomery and Sheriff Jim Clark in Selma, Alabama in the middle 1960s. In the debate within SNCC over whether to continue nonviolence policies by joining the Selma March, Lewis stated that there could be no crown without cross, no Easter without Good Friday. He reaffirmed, in effect, weakness is power. So he joined the march against the advice of some of the leadership in SNCC. Niebuhr, on the other hand, tended to relegate the law of love, the way of the cross, to a place outside the political realm. Self-sacrificing love, a readiness to forgive, makes sense between individuals, uh, within families, among friends, but it does not make sense, according to Niebuhr, in the public arena. Uh, that involves the push and pull of groups and parties primarily and unavoidably, in Niebuhr's view, driven by their own self-interest. Uh, this uh, point of Niebuhr's is well illustrated by a book he published, a famous book, published in 1932, uh, uh, titled, and notice the title, Moral Man and Immoral Society. Um, that means that society, that is collective life, is somehow subject to self-interest, sin, if you like, 
in a way that individual life is not. And, and love and forgiveness become relegated by Niebuhr into that personal face-to-face -face realm and removed from the political realm. Uh, in the political realm, uh, you can only achieve what Niebuhr called proximate justice based upon a balance of power and backed up by the use of force. Force is going to be terribly important in uh, the, the public realm. I think Niebuhr moderated, modified these views, but he never gave them up entirely. For Niebuhr, love stands as an impossibility, uh, uh, sorry, an impossible possibility, a kind of ultimate reference point above and beyond which uh, the uh, uh, public realm cannot be uh, conducted. Um, so love is relegated to private life, uh, force and justice are relegated to the public sphere. And the two uh, cannot really be mixed very well. Uh, Christians must in Niebuhr's mind lower their sights about what can realistically be expected out of the political engagement. And the kingdom of God as a meaningful or realistic achievable end is really uh, a non-starter basically from his point of view. Um, this is all of what amounts to what Niebuhr called Christian realism. And by the way, Christian realism had an enormous impact on political scientists, uh, on people like Hubert Humphrey, on diplomats like George Kennan, on American historians, prominent ones like Arthur Schlesinger. Niebuhr had an enormous impact on sort of reducing the moral expectations that are realistic in the public arena. Uh, now, it is true, incidentally, that in Moral Man and Immoral Society, Niebuhr himself famously recommended a nonviolent strategy for overcoming racial injustice in America. He wrote, nonviolent methods are particularly strategic as a means of overcoming by an oppressed group the, their hopeless position as a minority with no possibility of developing sufficient power to set against their oppressors. It is hopeless for the Negro, said Niebuhr, to expect complete emancipation from the menial social and economic position into which the white man has forced him merely by trusting in the moral sense of the white race. It is equally hopeless to attempt emancipation through violent rebellion. So strategically, tactically, Nonviolence is very worthwhile for the black people in that particular context. Lewis and King both refer explicitly to this very passage in Moral Man and in Moral Society. Thought about it a lot, invoke it a great deal. In fact, Martin Luther King says that was the kind of crowning moment in my uh, association with the nonviolent strategy. Gandhi helps, but, but this original inspiration comes from Reinhold Niebuhr in that, that very passage. Um, however, for Niebuhr, as I said, the advantages of nonviolence methods must be pragmatically considered in the light of circumstances. Nonviolence for Niebuhr was one tactic among many, depending on the circumstances. He rejected explicitly his earlier absolute commitment to pacifism, which by the way was characteristic of many social gospelers, coming to believe as he did that under some conditions, for example, opposing fascism, it might be necessary to use force. And he certainly believed that the enforcement of just laws and policies is absolutely indispensable in the real world. Uh, there is a question whether Lewis and King thought otherwise. Uh, and the answer is, I think, not entirely certain. I want to emphasize something that doesn't get emphasized very much in discussions of Lewis and King, but I think it's there and it needs to be brought uh, to consciousness. On the one hand, both Lewis and King at times describe themselves as absolute pacifists, 
never ready under any circumstances to condone force. And much of what they said conforms to that description, using force to achieve uh, the kingdom of God in Lewis's mind is a contradiction in terms. Bringing about a loving community requires a loving means. The use of force inevitably arouses antithesis against love and forgiveness and therefore must be avoided. You can see that. King again and again asserted that. You must use loving means to a loving end. If you use unloving means to a loving end, you pervert the very uh, activity you're engaged in. On the other hand, and this is the qualification, uh, Lewis and King sometimes called upon the federal government to enforce the law against segregation and discrimination, implying that certain kinds of force under certain kinds of circumstance are justified. In 1961, Lewis joined the Freedom Bus Rides into the South to test the enforcement of Boynton v. Virginia, a 1960 Supreme Court ruling outlawing segregated public facilities for interstate travelers. He discovered, as you well know, in a very costly way that those laws were not going to be enforced. Uh, and after the Selma March in 1965, Lewis himself suffering a fractured skull from being so badly beaten by uh, uh, Jim um, uh, Clark, Jim, Sheriff Jim Clark's uh, uh, violent tactics uh, and speaking at that time before a large group of people, some of whom had also been wounded in the Selma March, uh, Lewis said this, I don't know how President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and to Africa and can't send troops to Selma. Again, this uh, emphasis on, on the enforcement of just laws against the opposition that he was facing. Uh, John Lewis and Martin Luther King in all their efforts were in my observation, testing the provisions in both the 14th and 15th amendments that authorized in the language of those amendments, quote, the Congress uh, authorizes the Congress to enforce by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. Rather belatedly, one may say uh, that that is exactly what the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1962 were doing some 130 years later, they were enforcing the provisions of the 14th and 15th Amendment. And those very acts are the things that John Lewis and Martin Luther King, as you all know, were so actively and forcefully engaged in. When it came to using force and exercising the right of self-defense, a subject, by the way, that produced intense controversy in SNCC over what SNCC's policies were, Martin Luther King, at least, was somewhat ambivalent about the use of self-defense. And this is interesting. Uh, Meacham brings out a statement by King in this regard. Uh, King is, is reported to have said, the question is not whether one should use his gun when his home is attacked, but whether it is tactically wise to use a gun while participating in an organized demonstration. What's the implication of that statement? It is that for people who have voluntarily, lovingly, if you will, committed themselves to nonviolent protest and who have actually been trained in the discipline required to bear the price that is to be paid inevitably in doing that, uh, they must keep the pledge to nonviolence. Uh, however, it is a different matter, the implication is, when it comes to protecting the lives of innocent people who have not committed themselves, who have not been trained in the methods of nonviolence. There, King seems to be suggesting the use of force uh, may be justified. Now, um, 
I don't know whether King ever said anything like this in another context, and I haven't been able to see any such statement from John Lewis. Um, but this, this is a Niborian suggestion, if you're following my point, in uh, Martin Luther King's comments. It's that nonviolence is useful and important in some contexts, but not in all contexts. And there's an ambivalence, in my view, deep within the soul of John Lewis and Martin Luther King over which of the positions is correct. Do they go all the way with nonviolence, or are there uh, conditions, circumstances in which uh, violence is uh, justifiable? It is true in Lewis's case, and I think this is a very important point, that when it came down to this conflict within the leadership of SNCC between Stokely Carmichael and his associates and Lewis and his over whether armed resistance is justifiable in the, human, in the civil rights movement, that Lewis stood firm. There's no question about that. In fact, he lost his chairmanship as, as a leader of SNCC because of his stand on this. He was voted out in a very dramatic uh, series of events that take place in 1966. He loses his chairmanship and uh, he leaves the movement in rather deep despair over the direction uh, because it was not just the use of force that Stokely Carmichael and his associates were advocating in contrast to nonviolence. It was also the black power, black separatist ideology that they were embracing in direct contradiction of, Mar of uh, John Lewis's position. In fact, when they took over, they expelled from the membership of SNCC all the white participants who had come and they specifically uh, resisted, opposed uh, the policies of integration that John Lewis, Martin Luther King had so strenuously advocated and continued to advocate as a matter of fact. Um, in other words, this whole division over force, non-force is what uh, brings things to a head in the black um, uh, civil rights movement. I should say that SNCC didn't fare very well under the leadership of Stokely Carmichael. It lasted six years under John's leadership, but it, it, in, a few, in a few years, first under Carmichael and then under Rap Brown, who was uh, eventually indicted as a criminal, uh, the, play, the thing falls apart. So one can say in terms of outcome, uh, this notion of nonviolence versus violence did rather well on the side of nonviolence. Um, what we can say about uh, John Lewis and uh, his relationship to Reinhold Niebuhr as well as Martin Luther King is that although there is some ambivalence, and I hope I've made that clear, and I think it's an important ambivalence toward the question of force that all Christians, not just Lewis and King faced, all Christians who look at the New Testament seriously, who take up the idea of force, non-force, uh, must uh, uh, face this question, must debate for themselves. It seems to me this is something the church in general, in its present form, should be undertaking to discuss what, what is the implication of one side or the other on that? Where do we stand on that subject? And the fact that Lewis and King were themselves ambivalent, although let's say tended to one side more than the other is interesting and is an exhibit worth considering on the part of all of us who are concerned about relating of the Christian message to public policy. So that's my point about Lewis and King in relation to Niebuhr. They embraced a number of his theological views. Uh, they shared some of his tendency towards lo looking in a realistic way at the political sphere, uh, the need to use force under some circumstances. On the other hand, they pushed the needle much further in the direction of nonviolence, of a preference for love rather than for use of force uh, 
than Niebuhr did, it seems to me, and were, were much less, what should we say, uh, unoptimistic. <laughs> they were much more optimistic, I mean to say, than Niebuhr was about what can be accomplished in the political realm. Well, I want to conclude here and open the way for our friend Wendell uh, by a, a couple of generalizations and final comments on faith and politics viewed from the view, point of view of, of John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Reinhold Niebuhr. So what do we say finally? This is a, a series after all on faith and the election. What do we say about faith and politics having worked our way through these various aspects of uh, the thinkers involved? Uh, John Meacham in his book, I, I mentioned that last week, his book, recent book on John Lewis, which I commend to you all. In that book, Meacham says, Lewis was driven by faith that the uh, beloved community of love and justice could in fact come to pass, listen to these words carefully, and therefore he declined to accept Reinhold Niebuhr's bleaker view. Read that again. Lewis, driven by faith that the beloved community of love and justice could in fact come to pass, declined to accept Reinhold Niebuhr's bleaker worldview. In my view, that is largely true. Meacham, I think, is basically right about this point. But I want to emphasize in conclusion that Niebuhr and Lewis and King shared three, uh, shared three common views. One, Christian faith had finally to be understood and lived out in the world of politics. Separated from the world of politics, the Christian gospel loses its fundamental power. I think that's a, a common assumption. That's, that's what Lewis, John Lewis says again and again. And of course, you find that in King and Niebuhr. Two, politics is a very messy business. It involves what I've called a sacred struggle, which means persistent, unflinching participation, participation in what Lewis called good trouble. You're in trouble if you're in the political world and you better understand that and take the consequences of it. No happy mindedness here, no easy, easy victories. It's going to be a tough slog. You better be fully equipped and aware to take that point on. Nevertheless, the game is worth the candle. Three, uh, to my knowledge, John Lewis never uh, acknowledged uh, in, in particular uh, words Niebuhr's uh, inclination to endorse force. Um, but I do think that he assumed that the enforcement of just laws is a key point in an interracial democracy. Uh, constitutional democracy seems to require that. And I see no indication in Lewis's thinking that he said, oh, well, we can do away with police, uh, armed force, and so on. He never said that. I just don't think he thought it through as clearly as he might have been. Where they disagreed, King and Lewis and Niebuhr on the other side, was over what we could call, I think fairly, Niebuhr's implicit conservatism when it comes to Christian realism. The idea that political life is by definition finally immoral, driven by nothing more than collective self-interest, and therefore subject at best to merely tolerable standards of justice, was from Lewis's point of view certainly selling short the idea of the kingdom of God, or in his words, the beloved community. Uh, I wanted to conclude then by reading a couple of things that Lewis says about his attitudes towards uh, politics, and that will set the stage, I think, for uh, Wendell, Wendell Primus's comments. A couple of quotes, if I may, from Walking with the Wind by John Lewis. 
in describing his overarching duty, as he called it, on becoming a member of Congress in 1986, Lewis says this in Walking with the Wind. His objective, his duty was to uphold and apply to our entire society the principles which form the foundation of the movement to which I have devoted my entire life, a movement I firmly believe is still continuing today. I came to Congress with a legacy to uphold, with a commitment to carry on the spirit, the goals, and the principles of nonviolence, social action, and a truly interracial democracy. And then he says this, which might give a little, in the light of what Laura's sermon was about, might give a little encouragement in a time of darkness. He says this, the government can respond. We proved it with the civil rights movement. The changes we brought about have been enormous. No one but no one who was born in America 40 or 50 or 60 years ago and who grew up, grew up and came through what I came through, who witnessed the changes I witnessed, can possibly say that America is not a far better place than it was. We live in a different country from the one I grew up in. The South is simply different. He goes on to emphasize that the battle is far from won, of course. All of us recognize that if we needed uh, reminders in the light of the infamous George, George Floyd event and the protests worldwide and national that resulted from all of that. Uh, John Lewis was fully aware, of course, of the deficiencies of our present system. Still to John Lewis's mind, the beloved community ever remains, and I think this is the thing to underline, ever remains a realistic ideal for American political life. With that, I'll turn things over to Wendell. W welcome, Wendell, and thanks so much for joining in. Well, thank you, uh, David, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you once again. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of time um, to um, uh, study uh, John Lewis. I'll give you um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is he was at the end of his career, he was the number two member of the Committee on Ways and Means and was chairman of the oversight um, subcommittee. He was also uh, the chief deputy whip elected in 1991. I mean, he came to Congress in January of 1987. So getting to be um, uh, the chief deputy in 91, I think, was a, probably a real honor, and he became senior uh, chief deputy whip in, in uh, 2003. Um, Mr. Clyburn, uh, a black member from South Carolina, is the, is the whip. Uh, and I think it probably is um, a lot of members would have trouble saying no to John Lewis. Uh, because of his uh, status um, in the day. And he was a very liberal uh, member of the Democratic uh, Caucus. Uh, he was, um, he, he uh, agreed um, that he voted no on the Welfare Act of, of uh, 1996. He was a staunch opponent of that. Um, it was a little surprising, I think, if you uh, think about his election. He was an underdog. Um, Weich Fowler was a member of the Ways and Means Committee and decided to run for the Senate. That opened up the 5th District, and the 5th District of, of, Democrat, of, of Georgia is a very Democratic seat. I mean, and so in the election, um, Julian Bond got 47% of the vote and he got 35% of the vote. And to uh, be elected uh, in 86, you had to get at least a majority. So then there was a runoff between Julian Bond and um, John Lewis. And you know, obviously 47 versus 35, um, John Lewis was kind of the underdog and Jul uh, Julian Bond was also a very famous black uh, 
activist in the civil rights community. Uh, perhaps that name is very familiar to you. But then he won that election of 52-48 and then held the seat uh, until his, um, his death. Um, in terms of, um, I mean, from my personal experience, I mean, I loved it when John Lewis came to the floor and his voice, his oratory uh, was very inspiring. Um, he was probably one of the, the members that you like to hear the best in terms of uh, the speeches he gave on the floor. Um, I asked um, uh, some of my friends um, on the Committee on Ways and Means uh, their perspective and so I'll, I'll, I'll give you their insight. This is the staff of the Ways and Means Committee. The Health Subcommittee person uh, said um, he wasn't a let the perfect be the enemy of the good kind of person. And he knew that change took time and incremental work. And his main interest was in curing injustice wherever that might be. Um, the staff director of the uh, uh, subcommittee on human resources um, said uh, kind of my favorite Lewis thing to tell school groups, he very rarely said things in members caucuses. I, I wouldn't say he was a uh, into the details of legislating in that uh, sense. Um, but and then lots of times, again, in these caucuses, he didn't speak at all. But any time he talked, they would put down their phones and listen. I mean, it was like the E.F. Hutton uh, uh, commercial. Um, and uh, this person said um, his main issue was foster care. You know, foster care is uh, children that have completely lost um, their parents or their parents have become drug addicts or, or whatever, and especially the LGBTQ foster youth. Um, and the more strikes you have against you, the more time Lewis spent on your cause. Um, the, the last thing, uh, again, uh, the staff director of um, the oversight uh, committee said, he cared about people, the human face of every issue. And he wanted to end the IRS's private debt collection program because it went after low income taxpayers. Um, he sponsored the Taxpayer First Act uh, and he managed to exclude low income individuals. Um, so I think, again, there was lots of times that um, the Ways and Means Committee is um, obvious, well, from my opinion, the most powerful committee in the, in the House. Uh, people that are part of the Appropriations Committee might argue with that a bit. It's an exclusive committee, meaning it's the only committee you can sit on. Um, there's one or two exceptions to that rule. Um, so the fact that he got on the Ways and Means Committee says something, again, about um, how popular um, uh, he was. Uh, and obviously he had a lot of interest outside of the committee, uh, civil rights, the Voting Act. He participated in the sit-in that um, um, members had uh, after the Orlando shootings against gun violence, uh, et cetera. And he was obviously a very beloved member of the Democratic Caucus and you know, also, um, I think everybody looked up um, to John Lewis. So um, I guess those would be my comments. But at the end of the day, I mean, um, you had to love his oratory. You had to love that voice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my little contribution. Um, oh, thanks so much, Wendell, for that. That's extremely helpful. And you're helping to fill out the record on Lewis. We need more of that. I think I heard Nancy Pelosi say on one interview, John Lewis was the conscience of the Congress, uh, which is an interesting way to frame this discussion. In any case, that, uh, that ends our, 
formal discussion. And now I guess the floor is open in 20 minutes or so for questions and comments. Now, Paul, so take over, Paul. <laughs> oh, that's that's all right. I'll just uh, scan the screen. And I think I saw Wayne's hand up. Go ahead, unmute yourself and go ahead. Excellent presentation, David. Uh, you did an outstanding job. Thanks, Wendell. Those were uh, how wonderful comments you made about uh, John Lewis and the, his uh, career in the uh, legislature. I do believe that one of the absolute best career moves that happened to John Lewis, uh, and he didn't realize it at the time, was being uh, elbowed out of SNCC by uh, <laughs> Snokely Carmichael. Mm -hmm. uh, the Black Power movement, which ensued after John Lewis left, was totally crushed by J. Edgar Hoover and uh, LBJ. They, uh, they very quickly put an end to uh, Carmichael, calling him a communist. And, uh, and then uh, they brought in Rap Brown, who uh, they finally convicted. And uh, the end of uh, SNCC uh, was, uh, was very quick. Glorious, yes, yes. And you're, you're attributing it uh, really to the nefarious activities of the US government, really, is that it? I, uh, well, I don't, I don't know if uh, nefarious is correct, but uh, I, do, I do know, I do remember that uh, LBJ was under extreme pressure from Richard Russell, John Stennis, uh, and Southern senators uh, to uh, put a quick end to the Black Power movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, of course, LBJ and his close relationship with Hoover, he used Hoover yeah. to end it. That's right. I think uh, it's interesting that you bring up J. Edgar Hoover because he plays a rather sinister role in this whole story. He's after John Lewis trying to make out of, as we all know, he was after Martin Luther King, trying to attribute to them communist leanings and so forth. So, so his role is, at least from our point of view, I think a little perverse in this respect. I think the whole Black Power movement and its failure to succeed needs much more care. I, I haven't looked into that at all. Wayne's comments are interesting in that direction. And that needs to be discussed because uh, perhaps it's not just due to their own uh, doings. It may be external forces as well. Uh, but that story is not very fully told, at least in my knowledge. Interesting comments. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Other comments? David, I sure. Oh, I can't hear. Uh... I wanted to call your attention to the. Um, there are some folks giving you some questions in the chat. This oh. one from Christian Rice. Well, thank Do you, you think Niebuhr and the Lewis King differences were related to differences in their eschatology? I'm reminded of King's quote about the universe being bent, the moral arc of the universe being bent towards justice. Not sure Niebuhr would say it quite that way. Right. Uh, I think there is a difference. Yeah, eschatology meaning uh, the science of the end of things. How, how, how does the end work out from a Christian point of view? Uh, Niebuhr's inclination was to delay the eschatology in a way. That is to say, as I, conforming to his views that the radical Christian gospel in a way lies outside of history, outside of political life and so on, uh, is simply a way of saying that, that, that we look to the kingdom which will be God's doing, not man's doing. And we have to wait on the kingdom. We do our best, we struggle within these uh, realistic terms of modern public life, use of force, pull and push of self-interest, collective group, political party against political party. Uh, a lot of that is pretty manifest, it seems to me. So, so that's Niebuhr's view. And the eschatology, the end of times, is we hope for what is to come, but the chances of realizing it here and now are not that great. On the, on the part of Lewis and King, there, uh, the chances of improving life in the, uh, on the model of the kingdom, of the beloved community, are greater, I think. And they think if you use these means, and they believe the civil rights movement in many ways uh, did achieve it. I would say, though, 
uh, that in that respect, King ends his life, as we all know, in a rather pessimistic mood. Uh, Lewis didn't share that mood, and there may be a difference between them. King is worried that the tactics used in the nonviolence movement just aren't sufficient for achieving economic equality, economic justice. He begins to move to Chicago. He begins to think about uh, new forms of demonstration and boycott and resistance, which will achieve these economic objectives. Uh, so there, there may be a bit of a difference between Martin Luther King and John Lewis on that point, but certainly one side of King, as Christian Rice suggests, is to bring the eschaton into the world and, and suggest that at least in part, we can do better. We can achieve more of the Christian objectives than Reinhold Niebuhr saw. So there is a difference there and it, it pays off as Christian suggests in relation to the kind of ethic they thought was plausible and uh, practical and so forth. So it, it's a good point, yeah. Jerry's question. Uh, yeah, there's a, uh, it, it, Greta, I'll get to you next. Uh, Sherry Trafford had also posted a, a chat, said, I'm curious with the rise of conservative Christian political power, if John Lewis was a counterweight. Oh, I would, I would think so, definitely. And that's why I read a bit of those passages. I think John Lewis, and he has a right to do this in the way that many of us who are academics and more observers, not practitioners, don't have a right to do. King does, uh, Lewis has a right to stand up and say the things that I quoted. Uh, things have improved. There is demonstrable a change in the right direction. It's not enough, there's much to be done, but that message uh, emphasizing the values, the sacred values, that is overcoming prejudice, overcoming bias, serving the needs of the poor, the least, uh, the, the most vulnerable. Those things we have made some achievement in, some accomplishment, and that needs to be remembered uh, to give us some uh, degree at least of hope. So he is certainly a counterweight. The kind of emphasis on serving the poor, the use of government to achieve these objectives, all of that way of thinking is a definite contrast to the white evangelical anti-government, uh, slightly racist or perhaps uh, importantly racist uh, tendencies, uh, very, very suspicious of welfare policies for the poor, very, very suspicious of the ACA, and what that means in terms of government involvement. The, the contrast could not be greater, it seems to me, uh, on points like this. And yes, John Lewis represents, for those of us who share something of his outlook, a very important contrast to the kind of religious emphasis that you're finding on the, on the right. Yes. Does that cover it, Sherry? Good, okay, Greta? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, David, and also Wendell for, for um, really um, wonderful comments. Um, I'm just wondering if, if either of you uh, sees anyone on the horizon who uh, <laughs> might be able to, to attempt to, um, to fill John Lewis's um, uh, <clears throat> very big shoes uh, obviously, we 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 just miss his voice tremendously. But is there is there anyone, in particularly, who has this same kind of religious perspective as part of his his um, his commitment to um, to civil rights and social justice? Ah, oh, I'm going to call on Wendell. I, let me say a word about that. I. I don't see, and that's the dark side of my comments about Lewis, uh, that is to say he represents the kind of thing that is such a strong contrast, but, but I think uh, liberal Protestants these days have lost the, the inspiration, they've lost the direction, they've lost the intensity of mm -hmm. a John Lewis. And that's one of the great things that's sad about the present mm -hmm. state of affairs. Uh, we don't see that. And, and in a way, the Democratic Party is now divided between 
uh, extreme views of one kind or another and the more moderate views without someone. And I think Lewis was this sort of person, even though he was radical in many, he, he wanted to work within the system. He wanted to work with, a, he, he knew as Wendell said, that politics is a difficult task. It is what Max Weber described as the boring of hard boards uh, with a drill. It's a very, very difficult undertaking. Lewis seemed to combine both a realism about politics and yet retained that practical vision, which did accomplish something. That we seem to be lacking. So I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer your question about identifiable figures who represent only, only longing for, pining for uh, people who might fill that role. Wendell, what do you say about that? Well, I guess I'd throw out the name of Michelle Obama. Um, <laughs> as one possibility, but uh, I'd like to go back to the, the previous question for just a minute. Uh, I mean, I see the, uh, the, you know, the white evangelical church, um, you know, has put life, the abortion issue, as the all-consuming issue. And, you know, much to my amazement, um, you know, the the white evangelical church, you know, is a voting block that 80% of them or so vote for the Republican Party. And um, my own experience, um, which relates to uh, what's going on in Congress right now is, um, uh, you know, there was a provision in, um, in the Democratic bill that was called COBRA that was 100% uh, government subsidy of, um, of the, your employer's health insurance. When you, let's say, became unemployed, you, lots, you also lose your health insurance. Mm. Uh, and so the, the Democrats answer to that was, we would give you a subsidy of 100% to continue to buy into your uh, employer plan. Well, that ran against the Hyde Amendment um, you know, 100% government subsidy. And, um, and I knew we would never be able to get it. So I helped convince um, uh, the speaker that we should do a simplified a way of putting the unemployed into the Affordable Care Act. Um, and that only cost 25 billion compared to COBRA of 75 billion. Well, the pro-life community went nuts. And um, I had the privilege of speaking to Mark Meadows about it for 20 minutes. And he and I led him through the arguments of why the Affordable Care Act is 100% Hyde compliant. Um, so, and I think, you know, the, the black church, you know, cares about racial justice, the underdog, the economic justice, et cetera. And they're also a voting block where 90% of that, of the black church who believes in economic justice, uh, you know, and these two, and um, maybe next Sunday, I'll talk a little more about this book that 30 evangelicals wrote uh, that really, argue that the church is being smeared by the white evangelical church and, you know, and their adherence to someone with Trump with all of his, um, uh, uh, you know, personal attributes, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about the partisanship and how the Christian church is being um, proclaimed to the rest of the world because of what white evangelicals say. And that to me is very, very disturbing. Yes. So clearly John Lewis was, um, you know, cared about many other justice issues besides life. Uh, and, you know, I worry a lot about our democracy right now where social media where it's just very hard to determine what the truth is. Mm -hmm. 
and um, um, and you know that you know the post said yesterday that you know Trump twenty two thousand claims that are just fa plain false and the story in the post where he was taking credit for this veterans bill where the veterans are now given choice of which doctor to go to et cetera and if if our democracy isn't based on truth how how can it succeed and and i find this all very disturbing right now yeah 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 i think uh, i think uh, i would certainly agree wendell thanks for those comments and they're very distressing uh the contrast between the 50s 60s and the present in terms of religious influence is simply palpable i mean in the 50s 60s Reinhold Niebuhr was on the cover of Time magazine. He was a clear advocate, had his loud voice, spoke for the things that we're discussing here. All of that has evaporated. There are just no uh, leaders of that kind representing the, the contrast to the white evangelical perspective. Uh, so that's, that's a functioning part of social media, I suppose. But we need to think, what, is, what else is it to function of? Where has the liberal church gone awry? Why, why has it lost this animus, this strong uh, conviction on the other side? And why doesn't it represent more forcefully and effectively that point of view alongside these other points? That, that's part of the, the, the reason I introduced this series on faith in the election. I think we need to think about our faith in the context of political events. And uh, we ought to continue to try to do that, it seems to me. Further, we're almost out of time, but Paul, anybody I else? Just, oh, yeah. Yeah, Greta, Greta has a follow-up and I think that- I just, Yeah, I just, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 finish, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I did just have a follow-up and I think, uh, Wendell, I, I think that, uh, that Michelle Obama is a, is a wonderful idea, but I'm also just wondering about her husband, Barack Obama, who I don't know how many of you saw, but he gave an absolutely phenomenal speech uh, yesterday afternoon in Florida. And um, I mean, I just wonder if, you know, he hopefully has many, many years as a former president, if, if there is, um, if there's a role that he can play that would be um, kind of a continuation of, of the work that uh, John Lewis was doing. Yes, that's a very interesting comment. And should uh, Vice President Biden win the, the election, it seems to me you may create a new mood, one hopes at least, in which somebody like Barack Obama can, can flower. Let's not forget, Obama himself said, and I've talked about this in previous classes, that Reinhold Niebuhr was his guiding light. So, uh, so that would help to bring back a, uh, at least a form of the, the liberal Protestant tradition. Uh, Niebuhr, uh, I mean, uh, Obama always represented that, I think, and perhaps now in a, in a new take on American politics, should we get it on November 3rd, uh, that may be more hopeful. So. So I should. I think we shouldn't give up hope in that regard. It's an important point. Thank you. I, um, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Up, you're muted. Uh, I'll unmute you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see everybody. Um, David, I think you had mentioned um, oh months ago about why aren't the Democrats more vocal about faith, mm. and. I have really seen in this past election between um, Biden, Pelosi, um, Harris, all coming out more verbally about mm -hmm. their faith, which mm -hmm. is an important part, I think, to win over the, you know, the, the moderate Republicans of faith that, mm -hmm. you know, they hadn't been hearing that message for so long. And I, and I think the candidates are doing a good job uh, along with all people in leadership on, on talking about their faith and... and uh... that's, a, that's a great point, Kathy. I think uh, I've noticed that too. There's a kind of comfort zone on the part of Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and others to talk about their faith in public. That's rather remarkable. And it's a change of mood, I think. So, so a sign of hope. Go ahead. 
you know, it started when, when Pelosi came back to the podium at that one press conference and said, I pray for the president. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's a rather different spirit uh, for the reference to religion. I mean, praying for a president mm -hmm. she does not particularly like is, is a kind of inspiring point, I think, yeah. Well, well, Paul, I guess, uh, what about it? We're... No, I think we're at the end of the hour and it was, uh, it went by very quickly and it was very engaging as always, David and Wendell, thank you very much. You get